And welcome to another episode of the Great Deception Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. Thanks for joining me. What a wild world we're in, folks. It's another dose of crazy town. And if you think it's going to get any less crazy between now and November, you're in for a rude awakening because it's just going to be wild. So buckle up. Find things to distract yourself from the nonsense, because that's what a lot of it is. A lot of it is nonsense. Now, there is some that you need to pay attention to because it's going to impact your day-to-day life. But a lot of it is just smoke and mirrors to distract you from what really matters in life. It's just to get you emotional, just to get you going, to put you in a state of anxiety or fear. So don't believe it. Live your life. Do what you got to do. If you start feeling anxious, go find a trail in the woods and go for a walk. Shut your phone off. Just go relax. Listen. Breathe. Right? It's pretty simple. And I catch myself all the time getting hyped up over stuff and worked up over stuff for no reason. Sit down. Take some deep breaths. All is good to go. All right, it's not going to solve all your problems, but it will get you back in the moment. And that's where we need to be. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to distract you from the moment. We're going to we're going to get to some orphan trains tonight. One of the very interesting topics that ties in with this whole old world reset, re who knows what did they do in the 1800s? Okay, and it's just a a wild, wild time in our near history. And I can only imagine what it was like further back because of how chaotic it was in the 1800s. I don't think this was the only time that things were this chaotic. I mean, for a straight century, it's just pure madness. You know, I mean, there's like fairy tale stuff taking place. And at the same time, you know, fairy tale type destruction. And then there's the, the fairy tale of the orphans. And we'll get into that. But first, we got some new members of the Great Deception Podcast Patreon. I want to thank Leanne. Thank you again, Leanne. Much, much appreciated. You've been a loyal member so far. I appreciate it. We have Landon and Eric are new this week. Gentlemen, I I appreciate your donations. The interactions have been great so far. Uh, And guys, that's, you know, aside from my DMs, the only other place I communicate with people really is, is through Patreon. So if you join the Patreon, you get all the Monday Night Master Debater video episodes, uh, I tend to put out the these shows if they're going to be video like this one will. So I recommend everybody watch it either on Spotify or Patreon. And I tend to put some of these up there free on Patreon so you can get a little look at it and uh, and see if you're interested or not to join the uh, join the team. You know, we have monthly Zoom calls where. We get together, whoever wants to hop on, we'll just either shoot the breeze, look, do some research, you know, there's anything. It's it's always a good time. Last time it was uh, myself and two others, and we talked for a good two hours and probably could have gone for two more. So guys, it's at patreon.com slash the great deception podcast. And the next meeting for those that are interested will be Friday September 30th. It will be uh, probably starting around 8.30. Again, you don't have to be there for the whole thing. You can come in and out. It's not recorded. Uh, It's just a place to get together and and touch base. Uh, So if you can make it, hop on by. So what are we looking at here? And what do we got going on in this world? Madness, right? It's the weapons of mass distraction that are going on that my friend Ron so aptly termed it. And that's what they're doing. They're just bombarding us with an overwhelming amount of information. So things that were important in history 
no longer matter. So any of you guys interested in this, uh, I know that my buddy Sam Winchester over at According to Sam podcast uh, this past week did a little clip from, I think the guy's name is Flexus, and uh, he goes on the street and just asks people basic questions. You know, like, what country is the Queen of England from? Uh, what country is the Great Wall of China in? Who fought in the Mexican-American War? You know, what countries? And these people can't get it. They're not even close. Like, like the the uh, who fought in the Mexican-American War? Somebody said Thailand and, like, Panama. It's like, I mean, these people aren't even close. So that's what we're talking about. These people are so distracted. They have no clue what's going on in reality. But whatever's fed to them as the current propaganda, they will eat that right up because they don't want to think for themselves. And what does that do? Well, over time, what that does is that begins to diminish history, the interest in history, which means they can erase things, right? We've seen it before with book burnings and things like that. We're seeing it on the internet with scrubbing of websites and old materials. I mean, I, I ran into it recently with the last video I posted. Um, I was looking for the video with the, the fire clip that I played in it. And I know it was from a live stream and I cannot find that video out there on YouTube anymore. So I'm going to keep looking for it, but this is the thing guys. So when you find something, whether it be a book, hard copy or PDF, obtain it, get a hold of it, stash it away. Same thing with videos, right? You find a good video, make sure you download that thing. Put it away somewhere. Get it off your hard drive onto an a, a, a alternate hard drive. Because we need to save the information because they're going to start burying it. Much like they've done in the past, it's nothing new. But what we need to be able to do is sift through that stuff too, and try and decipher what the hell really happened. Because obviously what we've been taught isn't 100% true. Now, is it 100% bullshit? No, it's somewhere in between. So what can we do as, you know, <laughs> I, I am by no means a historian. I am just a mere internet researcher. You know, I do it as a hobby, as something fun that interests me. And... You know, looking at this stuff, who knows what we're going to find sometimes. And sometimes, the, yeah, we do try and create conspiracies out of nothing. But again, remember what a conspiracy is. It's just two people getting together, right, to obtain an objective outside the means. And And what we're looking at is these people here... It's the same players over and over again, or similar players, or players that are, are connected. Okay, so when you hear people say, you know, it's an old, it's a big club and you ain't in it, it's damn true. That's how this country was built. That's how this world is run. Either you're in the club or you're not. And obviously, guys, these poor kids were not part of the club. So what's the orphan train? I had never heard of this thing before I started getting into this old world research. And, you know, like I said, I, I had a history minor. History and poli sci, good old degree that I never used until the Great Deception podcast. No, um, but yeah, this is stuff that that you're never really taught. It's kind of just swept over. And it, in all reality, it's pretty significant. It went on for 75 years, <laughs> you know, almost a century, three quarters of a century this went on, and they don't teach it as part of our history, which is mind-blowing. So what was it? Back in 1854 through 1829, there were a system of trains set up that would bring orphans from the East Coast out West. Now, how many? Ah, estimates are around 250,000. Okay, so we're not talking these small number here. Many of them from New York. Okay, and if I uh, 
Let me scroll over here and see if I can find that map I had. Is this it? Nope. That's the, here it is. Okay. So if we look at who rode the orphan trains from 1853 to 18, or this says 1910 in this document, um, it says the trains continued till 1929, like we said before. The majority of the kids came from New York, about 33,000. Okay. East Coast, about 1,500 from Connecticut, 1,500 from New Jersey, a couple hundred from Mass, a couple hundred from, or no, a couple hundred from Mass, a couple hundred from Rhode Island, uh, a little over 100 from New Hampshire. Then we go over to the Midwest. Now, this is where you start getting interesting again, okay? We look at Ohio, 7,200. Michigan, 5,200. Illinois, uh, I think that's 9,100. I, I can't tell which one is for Illinois. Wisconsin, we're looking at 2,700. All throughout the Midwest. And then you get to the Rockies, right, where there's nothing. And then there's really not much moving. I'm, I'm surprised there were 1,300 in Texas. That's a pretty high number, it seems like, that would, would have been moved. Uh, or who rode the orphan trains? Zero from New Mexico. Or no, Arizona, sorry. Interesting. So let's uh, let's take a look at a, a great little video that sums up the orphan trains and some of the conspiracies around it. Now, she goes a little deep into this, so let's sit back and hear what she has to say. Between 1854 and 1929, nearly a quarter of a million orphaned children were resettled under what came to be known as the Orphan Train. A man that went by the name Charles Loring Brace was the first Freemason in charge of the Orphan Train movement in the USA. After the reset, many cities were completely empty. These cities were actually found by Masons first. They organized the World Fairs, which seemed like camp since everyone had a passport number and they would hold it up like an inmate. However, they repopulated these empty cities with children and families from around the world from 1854 to 1929. This operation took children from their parents from several countries and many states here in the USA. These children were stolen and bought and sold into slavery. What better way to repopulate these empty cities and indoctrinate these children. And while researching this topic, it dawned on me, doesn't Disney always have motherless children or there's orphans? So I decided to look into it. 56 of 140 animated feature films distributed by Disney since 1937 have characters who are orphans or has a missing or single parent or their parents were killed. We know why Disney keeps killing parents, and the predictive programming always goes pretty deep. And at the same time of the whole orphan train operation, we see that there were many insane asylums, and that's where they put possibly their parents, all the woke people, the people that were red-pilled and wouldn't go along with the programming. That's why they got treatments and lobotomies. So... As you can tell there, she brought up a few controversial topics that she mentioned there. One, she mentioned the dead cities, the empty cities. Now, I've I've been researching that a little bit. I, I haven't found any you know solid proof of it, but I haven't dug that deep into it. I've looked into um, Edward Moybridge's you know empty photograph of San Francisco and got a better explanation of that. Uh, for and that was again in the like I think the 1870s, 1860s. So that wasn't as early. But again, there is a lot of speculation out there that these cities were found dead and they were empty because of you know catastrophes, disease, mud floods, things like that, natural disasters, and self-inflicted. So. It, that is an interesting take there. Now, the other interesting take she has is the World Fairs and how these orphans were taken to the World's Fairs, given passports. And that's an interesting topic because if you think about it, were they numbering these kids because normally they would be outside the system? 
being orphans, having no parents, really not into the system. So this was a way to reel them into the system to make sure you didn't lose any money and that the eventually these children would become taxpayers and not just work outside the system. I don't know. Uh, just something I was thinking about when the whole World Fair and, and she said passport. And I automatically, whenever I hear passports, I'm thinking numbering, I'm thinking identification, you know, kind of like we heard about in World War II. Um, that IBM had a nice system to keep track of people. So I, I don't know. Uh, it's it's an interesting topic, something people can look into. Now, the other thing she mentions is the asylums, right? Now, we, we look into why were there so many orphans, right? Well, why were there? Well, it's said that in around 1850, there were about 30,000 orphans running around New York City. Again, why? Well, and, and 30,000 out of a population of about 500,000. So you're looking about 5 6%. Of the population is these, you know, and it's funny because uh, one of the pictures calls them street Arabs, you know, and it's like a ar very artistic photo of these two poor kids just cuddled in, in a corner in the street. And it's like, really? Street. And, and the other one, street rats. Obviously, I'm sure some of you have heard that. We get in, and we'll get into this here in a minute, the newsies. Right. That's an interesting story in itself with those kids. But the asylum thing, that was one of the factors. Right. People were taken to asylums. Their kids were taken away from them. Now, there were, was rampant disease at this time. Typhoid, yellow fever, the flu was killing a lot of people was one of the things that caused these kids. Now, the other problem at the time, in addition to illness, was poverty. Poverty was a huge factor in this. Why? Because parents couldn't afford to feed their kids. So rather than see their kids starve, they would willingly give their kids away to a good family. Sell their kids. And then, of course, you had things like addiction, alcoholism, things, same issues we deal with today. And the same reason why we have fatherless children, motherless children today. But there was a massive amount of immigrants coming over from Europe. So some of them didn't survive, but their children did. So we have this, you know, domino effect. So there's all these kids. Well, then all of a sudden there's this guy, Charles Loring Brace, right, who comes along. Because what's he see on the streets? He sees these newsies, right? And I don't know if, I know there's a movie out there called Newsies, and it's kind of like a, what are those things called? Uh, where they sing and dance? Yeah. So, but you look and, and these are real, I mean, kids huddled around a fire in the street, kids sleeping together in bunches on the street, no shoes, you know, and we're talking New England, Northeast climate where it gets cold in the winter. These kids don't have proper shelter, clothes, food, guidance. I mean, you just look at all these poor souls and you're like, man, how, how does this happen? When at the same time, we these huge mansions are being built. But welcome to the world we live in. One of the main factors in this was there were, were no child labor laws. No child protection whatsoever at this time. So... You know, kids would be working at five years old. They said selling rags and stuff. And so you look at that and you're like, wow, things were bad. And well, one of the things they did was they sell newspapers. They worked in factories, worked in mines. So was it, were they better off going to some of these families? In some instances, yes. And in other instances, no way. Think about that. 250,000 kids. And they're going to paint it as the majority were good. I can't buy that. And you know why? Because think about the world today. There's a lot of messed up people. Think about how bad it must have been back then. 
right? I mean, these people would take these kids in, right? And, and so let's get into to how does this whole thing come about? Okay, so we have... Let's get let, let's go look at this article because this uh, Angelique Brown on uh, social welf welfare library at vcu.edu did a nice little piece here and she says a couple interesting things and she's just talking about the movement again like we talked about 1854 to 1929 she says approximately 200 thousand everywhere else I see it's 250 if not higher um, and she brings up Charles Brace so I had never heard of this guy before. And so he is the founder of the Children's Aid Society, and we'll look up that too, who first came up with the idea of placing needy children with families in the West rather than in orphanages. Sounds like a great idea, right? The problem was this guy was a blatant racist and, you know, hated everyone except for Protestants. And we'll see that when we dig into him a little bit more here in a minute. Brace felt that orphanages were overcrowded and gloomy places did not teach children to become productive and fun functioning adults who could take care of themselves. Brace believed that a strong family life could help these uh, victimized children uh, and neglected children. Knew that the American pioneers who were settling West could use help and felt that an arrangement that would place children within these families would be mutually beneficial. He thought that the farmers in the West would welcome the children, take them in, treat them as their own. Therefore, he arranged to send the orphan children to pioneered families. The orphan trains in the practice of placing uh, children out into homes that would accept them as the precursor to modern foster care systems in the U.S. He said the best asylums, uh, best of all asylums for the outcast child is a farmer's home. The great duty is to get these children of unhappy fortune utterly out of the surroundings and send them away to a kind Christian homes in the country. Now, here's the interesting thing. Do you think these kids have any say in where they're going? None whatsoever. Many of them were just put on the train and, and sent all over the country. Some through the world's fairs. Some throughout. And they would come into these, and, and I'll show you here in a second, some of these posters. You know, they would advertise, orphans are coming in, get ready for the orphan train. And people would just come out and pick up some orphans. Now, they they say here, you know, uh, a solid family. Well, the problem was in these families, these kids were treated as less than in, in most cases. They weren't really a part of the family. They were labor. They were no more than like a donkey or a cow, sheep, something that produces, that works. I mean, they were used for labor. I mean, some in some instances, they were used as damn chimney sweeps. I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable, and I'll show you a picture of that later. But I think, in reality, he said it best: they were just out there to repopulate the West, or to populate the West. Obviously, they needed help with work in the farms and fields and. And, and mines. I mean, these kids were working horrible, horrible jobs. And there's instances where they were taken from their mother. Right? Just taken from her. Or she was in the hospital. And they would send him on an orphan train. And he's like, well, wait, wait. I can't go. My mom's in the hospital. I'm like, well, tough kid. Get on the train. And then who knows if he ever reconnects with his mother or not. God only knows where they sent him. And this is, this is the precursor to the foster care system. But this 75 years of, I say terror. I mean, I, I, I tend to think this is, you know, borderline child abuse because these kids have no say in the matter whatsoever. And there's very little oversight on any of this. It's not like after these kids are, uh, are getting scooped up off these trains that uh, Department of Child and Family Services is going to check in on them, right? Because there is no, there's no children's protection at this time. But that's what this leads to. This leads to child, you know, health and welfare laws, child labor laws. These kids can't work in the mines anymore. 
Okay, so it says here, in the beginning of the orphan train movement, the trains took children across the country, were litter, little better than cattle cars, and only had makeshift bathroom facilities. The conditions on the train cars improved in the later years as more money became available. And in the final years, the children rode in sleeping cars. At any one time, there were between 30 and 40 children, infants to teens, traveling with two to three adult chaperones. The children often had no idea where they were going and were only told that they were going to take a train ride. That's insanity. Right? That's craziness. How can we... How can we even, you know, think that that makes any sense? It said the confused and frightened children lost contact with their families in their hometown. And those that were old enough were encouraged to take a complete break with their past. How do you erase history? Make people forget about their past. When children arrived in the new area where they were to live, there was no formal process to place them with new families. There were only handbills that announced the distribution groups of needy children that brought crowds of prospective parents to view and choose the children. Although the Children's Aid Society made a point of emphasizing the success stories of the children who were well cared for and loved, the outcome of the placements in general was mixed, as you would expect. I mean, with that massive amount of children. Some of the farming families saw the children only as cheap labor. There was also evidence that some of the children experienced abuse in their new in new homes. Hey, right? I mean, that's something that doesn't doesn't surprise you. Should not surprise you at all. Okay, it says, I do remember the children milling around outside the train waiting to be assigned our seats. The big problem was that you never know what the future held for you. You had no idea what the future ever held for you. And that was a great concern and a great wor worry that was lean nailing an orphan train rider. Now, how real that quote is, I don't know. But at the same time, think about it from the kid's perspective. How terrifying must this be? And as they said before, you had 30 to 40 kids with three adults. That's some great supervision right there. Right? On a train, and you have in from infants to teens. There can this just a, a recipe for disaster and abuse and disease. And it's just so let's take a look at the movement a little bit further okay and i want i want you to take a look at mr brace and that's where we're going with this in 1853 protestant minister charles loring brace founded the children's aid society of new york city okay before we do that i actually i wanted to go back here and i want to check out this video right here cuz this talks about it um in a very easy to understand manner. It was March 15th, 1906. The train pulling into the Eastern Iowa town of Hopkinton that morning would have attracted an unusual amount of attention. Townspeople would have stopped what they were doing to watch. Shop owners would have stood in their doorways as the locomotive slowed near the depot. A notice placed in the Hopkinton newspaper days earlier had described the upcoming arrival of a company of orphan children. It said, the object of the coming of these children is to find homes in your midst, especially among farmers, where they may enjoy a happy and wholesome family life, where kind care, good example, and moral training will fit them for a life of self-support and usefulness. Inside the train that day, eight children would have peered out the windows, wondering about this place so far from New York. The group soon made its way off the train and down the block to the Hotel Hopkinton. After changing into the finer clothes they had been given, they were escorted to the nearby Masonic Lodge, where a group had gathered to see the children being offered. The boys and girls were asked to stand and sing a song, recite poetry, 
anything that might endear them to the crowd. By the time the gathering had ended, each of the eight children had gone home with a different set of strangers. Between 1854 and 1929, this scene played out many times across the United States, particularly in the Midwest. These trips, which essentially amounted to the resettlement of a quarter of a million children, were later collectively described as the orphan train movement. So there you have it. Think about that. They had to go and sing and dance and try and make themselves presentable to these people like a little monkeys or little cows you know just going for slaughter do what you got to do to get the highest price maybe somebody will love you and that's just that's such a wild concept and we saw it right growing up in the in the 80s like i did uh you know 80s and 90s was my majority of my childhood and uh little orphan annie Right, there's all these orphan stories. And like they said in the first video, 56 out of 140 Disney motion pictures had an orphan or dead parent. That's over a third. Is that the way the and again, I I I think that you know movies, entertainment should represent what happens in reality for the most part right so if if the if we're getting these movies right um about orphans then there should just be an abundance of orphans but there's not right there's a lot of broken homes now that's a whole different story a lot of divorced parents but the, you don't hear about the number of orphans anymore i mean there's foster homes all over the world Obviously, there's agencies that take care of this stuff. They're corrupt as shit. So anything you can do. Now, think about this, though, guys. The, bed, the You got to be a good parent. Fall on your sword. Do what you got to do. Take care of your damn kid. They didn't choose to be brought into this world. They deserve guidance, leadership, love, affection. Okay, it's not that hard. You just have to be there for them. A lot of the time, that's it. Just show up. Best parenting advice my grandfather ever gave me. So when you have kids one day, he goes, just be there. And it sat with me, man. And I've sacrificed a lot to be with my son. A lot of my life, a lot of financial things. But that's not what matters. What matters is that boy and that boy having a dad he can count on, he can trust. And these kids didn't have that. And that's heartbreaking. But at the same time, we look at it and what does this do? This is a quarter of a million kids back in a time when the population isn't huge like it is today. So it's a lot of people that have no past. No idea where they came from. No ties to their past. This is the great reset, right? And what do they do? They stick them with another family. So now they can take that family's history if they want, but they still have no clue where they came from. And that's a huge part of this, guys. That distraction, deception. And this is a huge play right here, I think. And, and, and in addition, it's just cheap free labor. Right? Think about it. Slavery, in a sense. They handed these kids off for slave labor. Rather than be, you know, quote-unquote street rats in New York, they sent them around the Midwest and West to go work, <laughs> to do jobs that they didn't have enough adults to do. Because they had all these lands, and I, I tend to believe there were a lot of buildings out there that they needed to be cleared. A lot of resources they needed to be uncovered. And these kids were a great source of labor. So how did they get out there? This is this Mr. Charles Loring Brace. And again, he is a member of the club. When we talk about this big club, the ties that he has, his education background, he fits the bill perfectly. 
Okay, so 1853, Protestant minister. I love how they hide behind the cloth. Charles Loring Brace founded the Children's Aid Society of New York City for the purpose of easing the plight of abandoned children. Uh, Brace viewed the orphanages as little more than human warehouses. We talked about that and lacked the resources, expertise, and incentive needed to turn orphaned into self-sufficient adults. Along with providing children the basic academic and religious training, the society attempted to find them stable and safe jobs. Right? This is job placement. These are infants to teens <laughs> faced with a rapidly uh, growing number of children cared for by the Children's Aid Society. Brace came up with the idea of sending groups of children to areas of recently settled American West for adoption. Brace reasoned that the pioneers settling the West, always grateful for more help on their farms, would welcome the homeless children, treating them as family members. The best of all asylums for the outcast is uh, child is the farmer's home. Like we said before, the great duty is to get these unhappy uh, fortune utterly out of their surroundings and send them away to Christian homes in the country. After sending okay, these nearby farms in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and rural New York in 1853, Brace's Aid Society arranged its orphan train delivery large groups of orphaned and abandoned children to Midwestern towns in September of 1854. Okay. October 1st, 1854, the first orphan train carrying 45 children arrived in uh, Dawagiak in Southwestern Michigan. By the end of the first week, 37 of the children had been placed with local families. The remaining eight were sent by train to families in Iowa City, Iowa. Two more groups of homeless children were sent to Pennsylvania in January of 1855. Okay, so it says between 1855 and 1875, the society sent uh, an average of 3,000 children a year to homes in 45 states, just dispersing the population, separating, dividing, right, from their past. As a strict abolitionist, however, Brace refused to send the children to southern states during its peak year in 1875, a reported 4,026 children rode the orphan trains. Okay. Once placed in the homes, orphan train children were expected to help with the farm tasks. While the children were pla uh, placed free of charge, the adoptive families were obliged to raise them as they would their own children, providing them with healthy food, decent clothing, a basic education, and $100 when they turned 21. I mean, I guess that's a, a nice little start these days just to get your beak wet. But older children who worked in the family business were to be paid wages. Okay, the intent of the orphan train was not to form a, of adoption as it is known today, but an early form of the foster care system as a process known as placing out. Families were never required to legally adopt the children they took in. So how would they be a part of the family then? If they were made, gave them their name, then they would sure be a part of the family, right? While the society officials tried to screen host families, the system was not foolproof and not all children ended up in happy homes. Rather than uh, being accepted as family members, some children were abused or treated as little more than uh, internment work farm workers. Despite these problems, the orphan trains offered many abandoned children their best chance at a happy life okay so that's it's just it's it's very interesting let's look at one more oops sorry i went too far i want to look at one more video here oops and this is uh and actually we're gonna skip that one because that's the orphan guy who who tells his story and it's just a long long story so child labor right there were no labor laws so they could then spread these kids out and start getting things going out in the midwest and west look at this this is what i was talking about before they were using kids as young as six as chimney sweeps they drop them down with a rope and a broom have them clean the chimneys this is insanity, folks. <laughs> insanity. Look at this shit. I mean, I, I saw this picture and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And this isn't the only one. There's others too. But I mean, there, there's a little 
little dude, no shoes. He's got his brush covered in soot. Pants and clothes that don't really fit, a little too big. He's got his little homeless boy hat. You know, and we get all sorts of these, a bunch of kids working in a factory. All right. And these, this is what happens when you have no labor laws. If you want to learn, yeah, you can look up foundlings. That's another way. And here's what I'm talking about with these posters. Okay. It said wanted for homes for children. A company of homeless children will be uh, from the east will arrive in Troy, Missouri on Friday, February 25th, 1910. Come by and see the children and hear the address. Distribution will take place at the Opera House Friday, February 25th at 1.30. So, I mean, here's another one. Homes wanted for children. This is for... Uh, January 1912. And again, the same thing. And they're always distributed at the Opera House, which I find interesting. There's got to be something between the Opera Houses. But here's a look at an arriving train. I mean, this is madness. Imagine being a child who was thrown on a train, not knowing where you're going, getting to the place, and you see this mob of people just there. And one of them's going to take you home. You don't know them. They don't know you. And you're rolling the dice, hoping you get some good, a good family to bring you in. Here's a little certificate from the Children's Aid Society. Okay. And it would say the name of the child, where they were sent. And then that's basically it. Placing agent. And then they were, they would say it, dust their hands off and okay, on to the next one. Painting of the orphan train, ads in the newspapers, okay, letting you know <laughs> and think. I mean, not everyone is a good person, so think about all the delinquents, the deviants that would read these and be like, Yes, yes, jackpot, right? And look at these trains, guys. This picture right here blew my mind when I first saw it, and it's the poster you see most of the time for the orphan trains. I think this is an uh. I don't know where this is in, but this is uh, in the 1900s. And it's just a train stopped. And there's all these orphans on the tracks, on the cars, on the platforms of the train. And it's just, it's one of those pictures that just, it's so creepy and eerie that it kind of gives you those goosebumps. You see these, all these kids, they have their, their tags, their little passports, ID cards, and one man in a hat and a suit, keeping them in line, keeping them moving. So where the orphans went. All right. One of the two main is, this isn't where, this is where they're from. Yeah, I don't think that map, that map's interesting, but we're going to skip it for now. But we're going to look, look at these cars, train cars. This is a later one, obviously, because they, they're not in a cattle car. And notice what they did with the orphans. They dressed them up. Gave them a nice, nice set of clothes. No shoes, obviously, for the most part. Lucky ones had shoes. And then they put a hat on them, right? And they taught them songs, to sing and dance. I mean, but do these kids look happy? Do these kids look like there's a better future ahead? And for those listening, I apologize because I'm describing pictures, but it's, you know, the side of a beat up train, kids hanging out the window, you know, what you would expect to see as an orphan child attire. Boys all have hats on, the girls, you know, some loose fitting dresses and overcoats and things. And they just look shocked traumatized and that's the overall vibe that i get from the 1800s this picture is like an epitome of the 1800s it's like that that same stare that you get at the world's fair the same stare you get after these fires it's trauma it's hurt fear 
anxiety, possibly uncertainty. And you got to feel for these kids, man. And some of them got a shit deal. And that's, that really sucks. Another ad for some orphan children coming around the area. Uh, let me check something right. Oops. There goes the ring light. Oops. Um, okay, yeah. So that's all we have for the picture. So let's go back now. This is where it gets interesting. When we start looking into Mr. Charles Loring Brace. Okay, so he was born in Connecticut, Litchfield, Connecticut, which is real close to where I spent a majority of my young years. In 1826, he was born. Um, he was named after his uncle, who was a lawyer. Okay, so he's not from a poor family. He was a defender of fugitive slave Thomas Sims. His mother died when he was 14. Uh, and he was raised by his father, who was a history teacher. He graduated from Yale in 1846. He pursued divinity and theology, graduate studies at Yale, but left to study Union theology, uh, Theological Seminary, from which he received his graduate degree in 1849. He was drawn to New York because it was viewed as the center of American Protestantism and social activity. His best friend and classmate at Yale None other than Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape architect, who also lived in New York. Now, this is what I mean about it's a big club and you ain't in it. Now, let's take a look at Mr. Olmsted here, okay? We're not just talking about any ordinary guy, folks. This is the man who is credited with basically being the godfather of landscape architecture, right? He's known to have done hundreds, if not thousands of parks around the world. Um, And the, the crazy part about it is that's not even what he was into, right? He comes from this family in Connecticut. Um, and he goes to Yale, all right? And, but it says, and they always have a story, right? Here's his. Sumac poisoning weakened his eyes, so he gave up college plans. Right? Here's the heart. And after working as an apprentice seaman, merchant, and journalist, Olmsted settled in a 125-acre farm, just a small farm, in January 1848 on the south shore of Staten Island, a farm which his father helped him acquire. This farm, okay, is still there today. But he's basically a journalist. And then all of a sudden, he hooks up with uh, I think it's Charles Vaux, V-A-U-X, and, or Calvert Vaux, here it is, okay? So he hooks up with this guy in, yeah, so here it is. Okay, so uh, a friend and mentor to Olmsted, uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, was a, a landscape architect. All right, and he introduced him to this Calvert Vaugh, whom Downing had brought to the U.S. as his architectural collaborator. After Downing died in July of 1852 in a widely publicized fire on the Hudson River steamboat Henry Clay, Olmsted and Vol entered the Central Park Design Competition together. Now, mind you, Olmsted has no background in this. And Vol is, is supposedly a professional. And this is just after... Their friend Downing dry, dies in this steamboat fire, which sounds a little Titanic y to me in my conspiratorial brain. But then this is what you see, guys. There's a lot of death around this stuff. A lot of the, the World Fair architects, same thing. They die. And that's why I want to look at Olmsted a little more because he's tied to Chicago, 1893. He's the man credited with 
the landscape there. Okay, so Vo had invited the less experienced Olmsted to participate in the design competition with him, having been impressed with Olmsted's theories and political contacts. What does that have to do with landscape? You know, I guess he's looking for an in. Prior to this, in contrast with the more experienced Vo, Olmsted had never designed or executed a landscape design. All right, so and then by 1861, he's leading the Sanitary Commission. And then he goes, okay, so look at this guy's the Forrest Gump of this shit. He's he's key to building New York Central Park, lead the Sanitary Commission. Okay, now for those of you not familiar with the Sanitary Commission, there were actually sanitary fairs which were like precursors to the world fairs. They would go around to cities and set up these tents and everything like that. Um, and they generally tended to the wounded from the American civil war. Um, but it said Olmsted headed uh, the medical effort for the sick and wounded at white house plantation in new Kent County, which had a boat landing on the, Pamunkey River. On the home front, Olmsted was one of six founding members of the Union League Club of New York. Olmsted helped recruit and outfit three African American regiments of the United States Colored Troops in New York City. He contributed to organizing a sanitary fair, which raised $1 million for the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Okay, so he's there, he's doing sanitary stuff. Then in 1863, he's going west to be part of the gold rush, right? This guy's all over the place, east coast to west coast. He stopped, and, he, and then he's going to hit up Chicago later on his way back through, right? This is insanity. This guy's everywhere, and you see this with these characters over and over again. They tie him to all these different events. And said, Olmsted went to become manager of the newly established Rancho Las Mariposas in Mariposa, gold mining estate in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. The estate had been sold by John C. Freeman to New York banker Morris Ketchum. The mine was unsuccessful. By 1865, the Mariposa Company went bankrupt. Olmsted returned to New York. The land and the mines were sold at a sheriff's sale. Like, dude, this guy's just... So he has no experience in gold mines, but we're going to let him run the project over and over again. And then he's credited with all these parks and being this great conservationist. It's just, I mean, he, basically Chicago, Buffalo, Milwaukee, um, you know, everywhere, Detroit, all over Prospect Park, Riverside Park. Chicago World's Fair. You know, I mean, this guy was just, oh, even the Hudson River State Hospital for the Insane in Poughkeepsie. And I've, I've driven past that. I used to work around there. Okay, it wasn't until 1883 that he became established what is considered to be the first, of course, he's the first full-time landscape architecture firm in Brookline, Massachusetts. So it's just, guys, it's these, and, and he's tied to Charles Loring Brace. Okay. So Brace was uh, a Calvinist when he decided he wanted to pursue his humanitarian efforts in the streets rather than the church. Brace was aware of the impoverished lives of children in New York City. And for this reason, he concentrated on improving children's situations and their future. In 1853, Brace established the Children's Aid Society, like we talked about before. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And this is what I want to talk about. The society in 1854, the society opened first of its Newsboys Lodging Houses, okay, which would become one of Brace's most successful projects. These houses provided basic room and board at low prices to homeless children. Room and board. At low prices to homeless children. They're charging homeless children to have a roof over their head. This is insanity. 
who hawk newspapers on the streets of American cities. Though Brace viewed the newsboys as children in need of the services provided by the houses, they also inspired um, uh, Horatio Alger's stories in which newsboys independence and pluck is rewarded with great wealth. But so what they would do is, you know, because pr prior to this, they would, someone else had a house like this and they would send the boys out and, you know, let them sell papers, but they had to make sure they paid to be able to stay there. Now, Brace is not the nicest of people, doesn't have the most uh, PC of, of opinions. And he said, uh, he wrote an essay in 1872, one crime and poverty ridden area around the 10th Avenue he referred to as Misery Row. Misery Row is considered to be the main breeding ground of crime and poverty in an inevitable fever nest where the disease spread easily. Many of the children deemed orphans were not orphaned at all. And when families of origin tried to keep their children, they were rebuffed. So they basically stole people's kids. Orphan asylums and almshouses were only social services available for poor and homeless children at the time. Brace did not believe that these were worthwhile, right? So he set up his own thing. Brace focused on finding jobs and training for poor and destitute children so they could help themselves. His initial efforts in social reforms included free kindergartens, not a bad thing, free dental clinics, not bad, job placement, interesting, training programs, great, reading rooms, fantastic, and lodging houses for boys. However, Catholic and Jewish religious leaders feared that Brace was trying to rescue the children from Catholic and Jewish faith. Okay, so we start looking at this, and it's really, really interesting. You would he would place these children. I mean, he was he despised non Catholics, right? He definitely saw them as less than. Um, and I'm trying to find it where it is in here. There was, oh, they don't have it in here now. I'm sure I missed it. But yeah, it might be in the Children's Aid Society. But yeah, they set up all these great things. But he, you know, he did not notice what did not get sent on these orphan trains. There were no minority children, no black children, no brown children. It was just white children. So... What am I getting at here? Well, this is part of what they did with this, right? This is that European Europeanization, Europeanization of America, the whitening of America. Because prior to the, really prior to the 1400s, it appears that this place was full of non-white right the natives and even you know some people debate that the natives weren't the true natives and there were natives before the natives they weren't white either so in order for this whole agenda to work this whole great reset plan of theirs to work they need to have their their minions out there right and that's that it's a shitty way to put it but it's a way to look at it, right? They're just sending these people out there to go whiten up the Midwest and the West some more. Make sure they get the numbers in their favor. Because as these people grow up, they're going to be taxpayers, going to be voters. And they're going to be part of the system. We need them in this system. And that's what this boiled down to. So you look at these these trains and what did they do well they would bring the kids an interesting thing is bringing them to the world's fairs um so they would bring them there and they would take them around and and have them tour the fair right get them their indoctrination get them their diploma they would graduate from the fair 
and then they would take them to be adopted. And if they didn't get adopted, they'd be on the next train and move to the next city. And that's how it worked. They just kept moving on and on and on until eventually they were adopted. And it's just, uh, you know, you're thinking a quarter million people, guys, back then. 30,000 orphans in 1850 in New York City, about 5 to 6% of the population. So we're not talking about small numbers of things. Now, add into this. And this is a whole nother rabbit hole, and we're not going to go down it right now, but I want you to think about it. The baby incubators and the inventoriums at these world fairs, they played into this as well, right? Because in here, let's, uh, let's pull them up. I'll show you what I'm talking about for those of you who are unaware of... Uh, of what we're talking about here. Uh, incubators. Where are the incubators? There we go. Incubator babies. All right. So we'll go. Oh, stop. All right. Let's get me back over here. Let's go full screen. Okay. So now we have these babies. It would be held by nurses. This is, I believe, in St. Louis in 1904. This is what they would have. They would have these buildings that would have incubators with sometimes one, sometimes up to four babies in them. More orphans? I don't know. But we look and, you know, like, look at this. This is an attraction, guys. Right here. Baby incubators with living babies. Once seen, never forgotten. Now, what's interesting about this, and this is a whole different rabbit hole if you want to look into it. There's some people that say that these babies were test tube babies. That they weren't, you know, natural births. They were test tube babies. They were a creation. A, you know, a hybrid almost. A new introduction into society. And that's an that's a whole rabbit hole. I've I've looked into it a little bit. Uh I haven't found a whole lot on the, the genetic side of it or the you know where how it took place, but these baby incubators, right? And this is Coney Island. And if you want to look into that too, a man named James Cooney. Okay, he took tours of babies around the country in these incubators, sold them, gave them away. Okay, and you look at these, these, these things would keep them alive. And, and obviously, guys, at this time, there was a lot of infant mortality. Yes, it, they're a great thing, these baby incubators. But also, think about a baby that grows up in this without its mother's touch, crammed in there. With two other babies in a, in a metal box. That's all it sees for the beginning of its life. I mean, it's, it's, it's traumatic. Again, it's more trauma. And that's what we see over and over again. But these, these incubator babies were at the world's fairs. And they would give them, them away there too. So this was just reshuffling of the population. Okay. And this whole effort was compartmentalized. Much like everything else, these kids weren't allowed to talk to each other, right? They didn't know that the train from the next town over was going out to Iowa and they were going to Chicago. They, they had no clue. So this, this Mr. Charles Loring Brace and, you know, once I see Yale that raises a flag and then I start to see his connections to Olmstead and the connections to the World's Fairs and, and all this stuff, it starts adding up to something where I say, I'm like, I don't know what is going on here, but something doesn't make sense. Because there are all these kids, right? There is all this bad, there's bad conditions back then, guys, too. But this, this is why we've, we've destroyed the infrastructure. We've destroyed the families. Like, there's all these babies 
kids without parents. And think about these people, these kids growing up, they've been traumatized for life now. Absolutely traumatized. And they will grow up to be traumatized adults. And that's what this is all about. This is how they, you're starting to see the pieces of how they put in effect a great reset. You disconnect people from their history, from where they came from, who they came from, any sort of heritage. You div separate them, right? Divide and conquer. Move, send them around the country. And at the same time, while you're doing that, you are repopulating these areas that had no people at the time or had very low populations that could certainly use a few hands. How convenient. And there, like I said, there was rampant disease back then that was causing this. You know, you look at 1845 over in Ireland, you had the potato famine. Thousands died. And I'm sure a lot of those orphans ended up here because it wasn't just orphans from America that were rode these trains. There were kids from Europe that were brought over here on ships and then moved around the country. So this is a coordinated effort. Now, they're going to tell you that, you know, we were just looking out to make these kids' lives better. And okay, yeah, I, I can see that. But I can also see there's an alternative agenda to this, right? It's never as clear as they put it forward that it's just, it's always a, for a sanctimonious cause. Everything they do is for the good of the people. No. They decorate it that way. The Patriot Act, right? The Inflation Reduction Act. They're all bullshit. There's nothing patriotic about the Patriot Act. There's nothing that will reduce inflation in the Indus Inflation Reduction Act. But they sell them to the people as good things. Orphan trains. You know, oh, we, we took these orphans off the streets and we gave them good homes. What about the ones that got the shitty homes? What about the ones who got sexually abused? Who got raped? Who got killed? who got sent to the alcoholic's house where he was beaten. What about those kids? You know, too many kids slip through the cracks. And that's the problem with society today. Right? And that, that old saying, it takes a village to raise a child is so true because that's the way it should be done. The elders should be raising the children, the ones with the most wisdom. The ones with the most knowledge. While the parents go work, earn a living, bring home the food. And then the family unit gets together at the end of the day. And that's the way it's meant to be. And now, you know, the days of the multi-generational household are gone. Gone. You don't see it anymore. I mean, a lot of my friends growing up, their grandparents live with them. You know, or their grandma live with them. You don't see that anymore. So we're, we're not passing down the traditions. We're not passing down the history, which causes us to not know. So anything that you are fed, you are susceptible to believing. And that's what this does with this whole reshuffling of the population. And that's where we are with the orphan trains, guys. It's a really interesting, I want do we have the XX ones here or no? Let's see. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite dudes, okay, the Improbable Dreamer on, uh, or the Doctor, sorry, Improbable Dreamer on Instagram. He's the Doctor on uh, TikTok. I don't go on TikTok. I get sent TikTok videos, so let's go with it. He's always good. It's a very strange period, indeed. Right along the time you had all those baby incubators going on, all these world fairs, you also had these going on. This was the phenomenon known as the orphan trains, in which our governments would round up orphans from 
all over and ship them off all across the country in America and Great Britain. Also, you would have countries like Britain passing laws where they would take single mothers' kids from them and throw them into these orphanages and put them on these orphan trains. Basically for the sake of purity was the reason. Perhaps those that didn't comply with the narrative would be put into these asylums also popped up all around that same period in time. Question everything, friends. Question everything, friends. I love how he ends it like that. And I've actually caught myself doing it on one or two of my short videos and I had to read it at the end of it because I'm like, oh, I can't steal his tagline. Question everything is the Great Deceptions line, though. But like he said there, right, it was a, con a concerted effort. It was between Europe and America. It was a way to repopulate or to, yeah, repopulate the West because I think it was populated before. I think this narrative we've been fed that the West is just this barren land with a bunch of natives running around, I find it very hard to believe, okay? I just I just don't buy it. But this picture right here, folks, is, is what really sits with me because this sums up the orphan trains with me. Do these kids look like they're going to a place of hope? Do they look like they have, you know, a hopeful future ahead of them? And they remind me a lot of the kids today. Just throw a throw a uh, cell phone in front of their hands or some some iPod uh, earbuds in their ears, and that's the kid. That's the look of the kids today. That look of just what's going on. And you know, I I don't blame them. It's it's a crazy time that we're in, but. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I, I find the orphan trains fascinating. Um, it's one of those topics that doesn't get a lot of publicity. It's a very significant event in our history, in the history of this country at least, and the way it was shaped. And the bottom line of it is, is that, you know, this, this was a, you know, a humanitarian effort, but at the same time, there's always an angle that they're playing. And we, we talked about those angles, the repopulation, the quote unquote whitening of America. I don't know. Another one of those very interesting things. But now, now that we've talked about this, go back when you're watching children's cartoons, children's programming, notice how many of the kids are orphans. And notice how many of the kids come from a nuclear family. I wouldn't be surprised if it's almost split between the number of orphans that you see and the number of nuclear families. Because they do not promote the nuclear family. And for some reason, especially in the 80s, they really pushed this whole orphan idea, the rags to riches, right? That was the saying. You had little orphan Annie out there screaming, singing her little red head off. I don't know. I'm not buying it though. I don't. I don't. I don't like the concept of the orphan trains. I don't like anywhere where you're just shipping kids around and there's no accountability whatsoever. It's just a recipe for disaster and trauma. Unneeded. You know. Hey, it may have saved some kids' lives, and that's um, that's outstanding. That's great. But some of these other kids, it just destroyed them. It was it was the, you know, <laughs> the worst time in their life. And you got to feel for them for that. So if you want to watch this, I highly recommend you do. Go over to Spotify. Check it out there. You can check it on their pod feed. Uh, it will be up on my Patreon. My patrons will get it first. And then uh, I will release it for the rest of uh, the general public, probably a day or two after, or a day after I uh, I release the audio. Um, so I would like everyone, do me a favor, please share, leave a review, leave a five star review. You can 
I, I, you know, I had somebody leave a one star review and it's hilarious because it's not even for something that I said. It's for something that someone else said on Master Debaters. And they said that it was they claimed that it was a great deception. And here's one thing I want to do going forward. I'm going to start uh, picking a uh, a review every episode and I'm going to read it on air. And uh, and eventually, once we get this show really rolling, when I start uh, reading reviews, we'll start uh, giving out some some merch with it, whether it's a sticker, mug, whatever it may be. Um, but maybe incentivize you guys to uh, leave some good reviews, some comical reviews, even if you don't like the show. I don't I, you will not hurt my feelings. I think it's funny. Uh, but yeah, at least give me a five star at least. You know, give me a five star. You could say whatever you want at that point. I could care less, you know, within reason. Don't go talking about my mom and shit like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I feel like I've been in middle school again with some of you fuckers. But hey, this is a fun one. Again, Orphan Trains. Check it out. I will be getting with uh, my man Casey from Golden Gate Star 4 Command to go over san francisco and california the history of california the history of san francisco he's been doing some research i've been doing some research he's boots on the ground out there i rely on him for pictures and first-hand accounts of stuff he's always checking shit out the dude's a great wealth of knowledge so go check out his page golden gate star fort command it's golden gate one word underscore star fort one word underscore command Okay, he's got a YouTube page and Instagram. Great work over there, my buddy Casey. So those shows will be coming out. It's probably going to be a multi-part thing because we both have a shitload of information that we want to go over. We're going to be looking at the buildings. We're going to be looking at parks. We're going to be looking at Google Earth. We're going to be doing a deep dive on the history of San Francisco mainly, but also uh, California in general. So that's going to be a fun one. Stay tuned. Um, guys, you want to help the show out? Patreon.com slash The Great Deception Podcast. You can contribute. There's a $3, $5, $8 tier. Um, I also have a Venmo if you want to make a one-time donation. All the links are down below in the description. I appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, the interaction we're having on Instagram is outstanding. The insta uh, uh, interaction I'm having with the patrons on Patreon is great. I would like to see more of it though. Um, I, I really love the interaction with you all, and uh, I think we can grow this thing, and we're heading in the right direction. But that's all I got for now. So, with that said, stay strong and question everything.